Around mid-2015, the staff of the Commonwealth Bank's Lightheart branch in Sydney's Inner West were at their wits' end. Those stupid smart ATM machines were driving them bonkers. The team had been continually reporting suspicious behaviour, with shady-looking customers causing havoc out the front of the branch. Someone would turn up with a backpack and a milk crate, set up shop on the street and hammer away at the wretched IDMs like they were pokey machines. They were shoveling bricks of cash bundles of 50s and 100s into the hole in the wall, sometimes until the machines jammed. This was not normal customer behaviour. The bank had installed secret alarms linked to the intelligent deposit machines, which would buzz inside the office if a customer spent too long shoveling money into the throat of those hungry beasts. The problem was that these alarms were going off continually. Bank staff joked that it was ironic the branch sat opposite a dry cleaning business. It seemed utterly absurd that out the front in plain sight, mules for money. Laundering syndicates were washing hundreds of thousands of dollars with impunity. The branch manager sent an email to the group security team with a one-word subject header. Urgent! He blasted it out in a hurry, not bothering to clean up his typos. We have had people coming in and depositing about five times into accounts with $50 notes. This is just short of $10,000. Then that night, there is a transfer sent to China for just short of 50 k They deposit into all different accounts until the ATM is full, then leave. This is crazy. If you review these people's accounts, they have sent millions and millions overseas. They could have no idea at that point that what they'd spotted was the tip of a multi-billion dollar criminal wash house. Criminal syndicates are always on the lookout for new vulnerabilities in the financial system. Crooks had pretty quickly worked out that the Commonwealth Bank's IDM were the go-to place to wash dirty sheets of polymer. Insiders knew that the machines contained two cash canisters, both of which could accept 3,000 notes, up to $600,000. No other bank was that generous to criminals. The AFP would run surveillance and watch young people on tourist visas run the gauntlet along a line of IDMs through Sydney. Some would have a driver. Others would just work their way along the North Sydney train line, like ants on a scent. It was a similar thrill to Aussie backpackers doing their rite of passage in Pamplona for the running of the bulls. After their bag was empty, they would throw it in the nearest bin and knock off for the day. For many a person from Southeast Asia, $300 a day and a holiday in Australia is like winning the lottery. And so, the money continued to flow down the networks of smart laundromats dotted across Australian capital cities. In August 2015, a customer fed so many $50 notes into the Lightheart Branch's IDMs that the internal alarm sounded three times in a row. A banker went outside to investigate and saw a person whom he described as a male who was tall with black hair of Asian background. When the account was investigated, the branch staff found that it belonged to someone with an Anglo name and NSW driver's license as ID. As soon as the money was deposited, someone had logged in via internet banking and zipped the funds off to an account in Hong Kong. The group security team investigated this one and decided that the account activity was linked to a Malaysian money laundering syndicate. An extensive branch network, 24-hour real-time banking, smart ATMs and cheap transfers overseas had made CBA the bank of choice for launderers. One of the other benefits was that CBA accounts seemed to stay open longer than other banks. Syndicates had pretty quickly established that a ComBank Online account was easy to set up with stolen ID and very rarely got shut down, despite the most egregious cash transfers. It was this can-do attitude that made CBA very popular with Southeast Asian tourists carrying milk crates and backpacks. It was an attitude that curried very little favour, however, with a small army of people within the Australian law enforcement community. These were people who put their lives on the line, day in and day out, in the fight against serious and organised crime. Over at the Austrac headquarters in Chatswood, on Sydney's North Shore, heads were also being scratched. The team worked closely with the AFP and knew about these vulnerabilities. What they didn't know yet was the extent of the problems. As luck would have it, they uncovered what appeared to be a small glitch with CBA's transaction reporting system. Routine data analysis in Austrac's Financial Intelligence Unit revealed the two threshold transaction reports. The compulsory reports for every deposit above $10,000 had not been filed. This was strange, as these basic reports were bread and butter stuff for a major bank's financial crime team. 
those two transactions related to a cross-border transfer from a CBA account to HSBC, which itself was in money laundering purgatory in the United States. The Hong Kong Bank gave Ostrak the reports detailing two $20,000 transactions that should have been reported by both banks. When Ostrak attempted to pair the transactions with CBA's reports, there was no matching record. As it turned out, this would be the spark that set off a brush fire that grew into an inferno at Australia's most profitable bank. Peter Clark, a senior official at Ostrak, ensured that the regulator followed these anomalies up with CBA. We made inquiries to the bank and as a result of that, we became aware of other issues, Clark said with his characteristic public service understatement before a Senate estimates hearing. At this stage, in 2015, Commonwealth Bank executives had no idea they had wandered into Australia's largest ever money laundering scandal. At the time, Ostrak had never really used its civil litigation powers. A few weeks earlier, it had launched civil proceedings against the gaming giant Tabcorp for money laundering breaches, but this was in its early stages. Anyone at CBA doing a risk assessment on the likelihood of getting fined by Ostrak would have deemed the agency to be a non-existent threat. In July 2015, following the detection of those two missing threshold transaction reports, Ostrak ordered the Commonwealth Bank to conduct a money laundering risk assessment on its intelligent deposit machine channel. The review found that IDMs posed a high money laundering risk. Inexplicably, when it applied a final rating, CBA gave its smart ATMs a low residual risk. The internal review did not spell out exactly how this risk management alchemy was achieved. The bank knew full well there were serious issues. Two months later, in September 2015, the bank's compliance team prepared a briefing paper on the reporting problems for the chief executive, Ian Narev. An investigation has determined that the two cash transactions were made through IDMs, it said. It was discovered that the deposits were not reported because of a system coding error dating back to November 2012. Even when these transactions were linked to the financing of terrorism in Syria, the bank remained largely unconcerned. In one case, the accounts for a suspected terrorist with links to ISIS remained open for 18 months. The suspected terrorist, who was on an AFP watch list, moved at least $8.1 million through the bank. Many months later, as the bank continued its internal investigation, the true scope of the failures started to become apparent. Even so, CBA still believed it could resolve the matter with an enforceable undertaking from the regulator. Essentially a commitment to do better, without any admission of liability. With APRA and ASIC wrapped thoroughly around its finger, the bank had no reason to think otherwise. But Ostrak was no typical financial regulator. As part of the law enforcement and criminal intelligence community, it was a different creature. The two missing transaction reports ultimately led to the discovery of another 53,504 reports that hadn't been filed. CBA took the view that the missing TTRs, which ran over three years, were the result of a single technical breach and should be treated as a minor IT issue. Ostrak differed. The more the regulator looked into CBA's compliance controls, the more problems it found. Alarmed, the regulator quickly organized a targeted on-site review at the other major banks. Sources at another Big Four institution said they had been preparing for a visit based on correspondent banking in October 2015. Without explanation, at the last minute, Ostrak changed the subject of the review to smart ATMs. The financial crime teams were left scratching their heads as to why Ostrak was suddenly more interested in basic ATM controls. They decided the regulator was just trying to keep them on their toes. The on-site reviews did not uncover any systemic issues across the banking sector, according to Peter Clark of Ostrak. We undertook an examination of the other major banks in terms of their IDMs, he said. We were satisfied that they had thresholds that were less than the reporting threshold for their transactions, and they had in place mechanisms to monitor and report. Some of the banks had exceptionally good controls in place to manage the risks associated with such a high-risk channel. Everyone knew that non-face-to-face -face cash placement would be exploited by criminals. In response, they set their transaction. Monitoring software and other detection tools to pick up and report anything suspicious. The most basic technology could ensure that criminals were never at an ATM long enough to need to bring their own milk crate work stool. In addition to its other failures, Commonwealth Bank had the highest single deposit limit at $20,000 and customers could just run one transaction after another until the machine seized. 
The other banks had set cash deposit limits for their machines of $4,000 to $5,000. At ANZ, for example, there was a 50 note maximum. Any more than that and the customer would be forced to enter the branch. At ComBank, however, forcing customers with large cash deposits back inside branches was not a welcome idea. That would have undermined the business case behind the push towards automated banking. There was a fundamental tension at play between the risk and commercial teams. And risk was losing by a wide margin. By the time Ostrak detected 174 allegedly late or missing suspicious matter reports at CBA, as well as missing reports relating to five terrorism financiers, the most serious type of reporting failures, the matter was escalated internally. Ostrak's chief executive, Paul Javtovich, and his team were tracking the matter closely. CBA believed it had the Ostrak relationship under control. In one internal email in mid-2016, David Craig, the bank's chief financial officer, told Narev that he had no reason to be concerned about this at this stage. The bank's board had just met with Jevtovic, who had apparently expressed no concerns about CBA's intention to be fully compliant with AML legislation. In January 2017, Jevtovic met with Catherine Livingstone, the bank's chairperson. David Cohen, by then the bank's chief risk officer, warned her that the IDM issue would be raised in the meeting, which of course it was. Narev offered to meet with Livingstone the next day to get the chair's instincts on how, if at all, you believe we can engage with them in advance of the final determination to influence it. In March, Ostrak again met with the bank. By that time, CBA had continually missed targets and failed on its promises to clean up its act. Back at Ostrak, Jevtovic's mood had shifted. A CBA staff member wrote back to Narev, they also said our failure to immediately and proactively tell them about these and other problems is a show of bad faith that leads them to wonder what else is broken across CBA's financial crime landscape. Things were spiralling out of control. But for Australia's largest and most influential bank, Ostrac was an unknown quantity. It had never revealed the iron fist of powers concealed within its velvet glove of public-private partnerships. Commonwealth Bank was still naively confident bordering on arrogant about the federal agency's powers and level of determination. How could an agency with just 300 staff and a measly $70 million annual budget pose a threat to a bank with an armada of the country's finest silks and a $10 billion per year profit engine to draw upon? The Commonwealth Bank spent more than Ostrac's entire budget on its in-house catering each year. At a 2017 board meeting, something changed. The mood had darkened discussion focused on whether anyone within the bank was facing personal liability. By July 2017, the bank's chairman and chief executive realised they were testing Ostrac's patience. Behind the scenes, the AFP was telling Ostrac about its own continual frustrations with the flagrant money laundering and terrorism financing facilitated by CBA's smart ATMs. Perhaps the bank's most senior people hadn't realised that Paul Jevtovic, the head of this little agency, had spent 35 years at the coalface with the AFP. The bank has desperately tried to get another face-to-face -face meeting with the agency's chief to smooth things over. This was how it had generally worked with larger financial regulators like APRA and ASIC. He emailed Livingstone late one evening to share his feelings of unease. Would Ostrac seek to make an example of them? In the end, none of the executive team at Australia's largest bank was charged with any offences. Narev stood down as CEO and the bank paid a billion dollar fine, but that was largely it. With a fine and a promise to reform their internal processes, the bank was largely set free. To their credit, the Commonwealth Bank has picked up their game. You can now only deposit $1,000 per day into their ATM machines. The days of seeing Asian men with milk crates in front of ATMs is gone. However, we can be in no doubt that the next money laundering scandal is right around the corner. When there is the opportunity for profit, there will always be a gang of criminals ready to exploit even the smallest loophole.